The rotated boxes exercise is one that has given students a lot of grief over the last many years it has been part of this course. It is very challenging in what it asks, but as stressed throughout lesson zero, that is the nature of how this course works. Students are regularly asked to do things they are not at all equipped to do perfectly or even well. The value of it comes not from the end result you get to show off to your buddies, it comes from the things we're forced to consider as we work through the exercise. It doesn't really matter how the result comes out. It only matters that you're giving yourself ample time to work through the task and that you're following the instructions to the letter, so throughout it, you're thinking about all the right things. As long as that's the case, it will help to gently rewire your brain and develop the manner in which you think about 3D space as you attempt to capture it on the flat page. Our goal in this exercise is to create an arrangement of boxes that rotates around a point in the center of the set. Some students incorrectly think this exercise is about spherical perspective, the kind of fisheye effect that leverages four to six vanishing points to create a grid, but this is not the case. As discussed in the lecture portion of the lesson, there are only as many vanishing points as there are sets of edges that are parallel to one another in 3D space. When artists use four, five, and even six vanishing points to create a grid, they're actually going beyond the core principles of 3D space to achieve a particular stylistic effect. For our purposes in this course, I want you to set all that aside. In the plotted perspective exercise, we were permitted to work both with vanishing points marked out right on the page and plot our lines back to them directly, leaving no room for estimation. Then in the rough perspective exercise, we were still allowed to mark out our vanishing points, but we were no longer able to plot all the way back to them. We had to estimate without drawing actual lines all the way back, and instead had to use our eyes and the ghosting of the motion to estimate where the corners of our boxes should be placed. In this exercise, we will no longer be permitted to mark out explicit vanishing points on the page. Instead, here we will be learning to rely more on the other elements that are already present in the scene, mainly the other edges and faces, to help us decide how to add those that follow. This is really the first major step we take towards moving beyond the simplified rules of perspective towards actually developing a strong underlying instinct for working within 3D space. This is something we'll continue to develop throughout this entire course and beyond. Because of this underlying focus of the exercise, it relies very heavily on arranging these boxes so their edges are, where possible, very close together. Technically, the word boxes is being stretched. As in the past, we've discussed how box doesn't refer to cube, but rather any rectilinear form where the edges meet at a 90 degree angle. That is a definition we're breaking here, for the simple reason that we can't actually arrange the proper rectilinear boxes in a way that would keep all of those edges close together. You can see this illustrated here from a top-down view. You might have the back edges fitting closely together, but that will force massive gaps between the front edges. Or alternatively, you might have the front edges fitted closely together, but this will cause the back portion of the boxes to interpenetrate one another. In order to get the arrangement we want, so this exercise can be used effectively towards its goals, we have to break this rectilinear definition of a box by tapering the forms as they recede from the viewer. In other words, the far plane of this box will end up being smaller than the plane closer to the viewer, not just because of the rules of perspective, which are applied in 2D space, but in 3D space as well. This is something I don't want you to worry about. I'm explaining it here for those few who would notice the logical inconsistencies and be confused by them, but I cannot stress this enough. The fact that we're not dealing with regular rectilinear boxes is not relevant and is not something you need to think about because we're not actually plotting our vanishing points at all. With all that out of the way, let's get into the exercise itself. We'll start by drawing two axes on the page, one vertical and one horizontal. They will be the same length and will intersect at their midpoints. In other words, 
the horizontal will pass through the vertical at the vertical center. Draw this with a ruler and take care to ensure that these axes are perpendicular to one another on the page. Centered on the midpoint of the two axes, draw a square with your ruler. This will form the plane of the central box of our arrangement that is closest to the viewer. Our goal in this exercise is to create an arrangement of boxes that spans over a 180 degree arc across each axis. We have the center position of this arrangement defined, and so we're going to also draw squares that will symbolically represent the boxes on the far extremities of this 180 degree arc. Place them at the ends of the axes and draw them with your ruler. They should be smaller than the square in the center because they're further back in space from the viewer, but you don't need to worry about how much smaller. In the past, this step was not part of the exercise. We added it when we noticed many students being quite timid when laying out the range of rotation. They'd rotate each box very minimally relative to one another and would actually be more likely to arrange them to be parallel to one another in 3D space, converging towards the same vanishing point. By laying out these extremities, which represent the box rotated a full 90 degrees, students remind themselves that they are to cover a more complete rotation. Some of you may recall that our boxes are not true boxes, so if we rotate the form by 90 degrees, the tapering should be noticeable. And later, as we start drawing through our boxes as though we have x-ray vision, some might ask why we've drawn these squares orthographically, only choosing to draw one face. The reason is simple. These are symbolic tools intended to remind the student what they're meant to be doing, making them any more complex We'll take this from being a simple reminder to just being yet another complicated problem for the student to solve. If we take a moment to think about how these boxes are arranged relative to the viewer and the viewer's angle of sight, we can see that this central box fits perfectly into the usual definition of one-point perspective. The plane oriented towards us is perfectly perpendicular to the viewer's angle of sight, so its horizontals and verticals run towards infinite vanishing points, leaving only the lines that recede through the depth of the scene to converge towards a single vanishing point. Now, using the ghosting method, as we'll be freehanding the remaining lines for this exercise, draw these depth edges of the box. This one's a special case, in that they'll be converging towards the midpoint of our axes. So like the rough perspective boxes, we have something concrete on the page to estimate convergences towards. This central box serves as our first tangible element in our structure. Next, we'll be drawing the box to the side of it, and in order to do so, we'll be paying close attention to the central box's edges. The central box has four edges that will be particularly important to us when drawing this additional box, because each of these four edges have a corresponding neighbor on the new box. We're going to be treating these neighbors as though they're parallel to one another in 3D space. This means that they would share a vanishing point. Here's where we get to a useful consideration that will serve you very well throughout this entire course and as you continue to draw in three dimensions. These two neighboring edges are very close to one another on the page. The vanishing point towards which they converge may be very far away, but if we think about the angle at which they meet at that location, because the lines are already so close together on the page, there simply cannot be a very large angle between them where they converge at the vanishing point. The farther off the page that vanishing point is, the smaller the angle must be. This means that we can get away with drawing them as being actually parallel on the page. 
This may not be perfectly correct, but it's close enough not to negatively impact the result. Similarly to how in math and physics, we settle on a certain level of precision and round off any decimals beyond it. In exchange for this rounding, we can massively simplify this aspect of the problem. Note that this is not limited just to lines that are physically close to one another on the page. It's all about the angle at which they meet when converging. One edge might be closer to the vanishing point and the other farther, while still having a fairly small angle between them. This is something that will be particularly important to keep in mind when we get to the 250 box challenge, which comes after the completion of lesson one. With the neighboring plane constructed, that leaves us with the opposite plane to construct, followed by the edges that connect the two planes together. Here we unfortunately don't have the benefit of any other neighboring structures, so we do have to estimate our convergences. We can, however, think back to some of the concepts from the boxes lecture to help us in making these decisions. Considering the central box's horizontal edges, they do converge towards an infinite vanishing point towards the left and right. Since I'm drawing the box to the right side, I'm going to think of the vanishing point being infinitely towards the right side of my viewer. The vanishing point for the central box's depth edges is conversely centered on the midpoint of the horizontal axis. As illustrated in the lecture videos, as the box rotates, the vanishing points will slide towards the left. The infinite vanishing point to the far right will shift to being a concrete vanishing point, sliding leftwards and gradually getting closer to the center of our composition. The other vanishing point will also move towards the left, although keep in mind that the VPs moving towards the center, like the far right one, will slide at a slower rate, while those moving away from the center will slide at a progressively faster rate. Keeping this in mind, we can start placing the farther corners of our additional boxes, trying to align them towards these newly approximated vanishing point positions. We are not allowed to draw the vanishing points explicitly on the page, which certainly would help in estimating those convergences, but this will get easier with practice. With our corners placed, we can use the ghosting method to construct the remainder of our second box. This process will mirror that of the previous one, and if you rotate your page 90 degrees, it will be identical. To quickly reiterate the steps, first we'll draw the edges of this new box which neighbor those of the central one. Then, keeping in mind the sliding of the vanishing points due to the rotation of our sets of parallel edges, estimate the positions of the remaining corners. Finally, draw the remaining edges using the ghosting method as always. Again, we're simply applying the same concepts. Find any potential neighboring edges. Any completed box directly neighboring the one we're constructing will provide four edges to use as guides. You can maximize this by ensuring that you're always building out from the center towards the corners. Once you're out of freebies from neighboring elements, you can shift to estimating based on the sliding of the vanishing points. While most of these boxes will be equally challenging, you'll likely find the corner to be especially tricky because of the extreme rotation applied to it. Don't worry if you get it wrong, but strive to apply the same methodology to it, first using your neighboring edges, then solving the rest by considering how the vanishing points behave. You may not nail it this time, but again, it is the process of thinking through the elements at play that is valuable here, not whether you get it right. At this point, we've covered all there is to know about the exercise, with the rest simply being a repetition of the same steps to fill out the remaining three quadrants. When doing this exercise as part of your assigned Lesson 1 homework, you will be completing all four quadrants. 
when practicing this exercise as part of your regular warm-ups, once you've had your Lesson 1 work marked as complete, confirming your understanding of the material, it may be worth only doing one quadrant at a time. This will make it more feasible to continue to practice the concepts of the exercise to the best of our ability in the limited time afforded by our warm-ups, although don't be alarmed if it still requires you to allocate additional time when this exercise comes up in your pool of warm-up exercises. And that about covers it. To summarize the purpose of this exercise, it's to help students get used to looking more at the information present within their drawing before referring back to elements that may exist outside of it, like vanishing points. A big part of this is thinking of the edges in the scene in groups of those edges that are parallel to one another. We've learned to think this way about individual boxes, but it goes beyond that. If you've got many boxes that are parallel to one another, like in the plotted and rough perspective exercises, you still only have three sets of parallel edges and three vanishing points across all of these many boxes. In such a scenario, if you had to draw yet another box aligned to those that are already present, you wouldn't actually need to worry about the vanishing points at all. You'd be able to look at the edges present in the scene and use them to add yet more edges that match. After all, every edge points towards a vanishing point. You don't need to know where that vanishing point is if you've already got all these arrows pointing towards it. There is enough information present for you to add as many more such edges to the set as you need. Ultimately, the more we can learn to work within the elements present in the composition itself, so on the page or within a given frame, and not potentially far off the page, the more useful information we have at our disposal, and the more easily we're able to work when sketching out our ideas. If you have to go back to one of many countless vanishing points when adding any edges to the scene, it's going to continually require you to break out of the flow state where you're most creative to find that vanishing point and plot back to it. The more you can rely on the information present within the scene, the more you'll be able to stay within that flow state and the more you'll be able to focus on the creative aspect of the work rather than the technical.